So now we're ready to actually hook up our hoses over here to our flow controller and the flow controller that we use is a double O-ring flow controller and you'll see an example of for example a cam lock connector. This is what you will need to hook up a flush cart to our double O-ring flow controller and all the sealing is done in and out of the flow controller with a double O-ring. You can see here there's two O-rings, one in front of the other. You'll see here there's an aluminum keeper ring and then a plastic nut. A couple of important components is that you should use a non-petroleum based grease. Okay, Take a light coating, I'll, I'll show you an example here. Take a light coating of this non-petroleum based grease and wipe the inside of all your connection ports. That would include all your piping connections as well. That will prevent when you insert this double O-ring fitting, that will help ensure that you won't roll these O-rings out of their seat because if you go to tighten this up and it still leaks, getting it tighter is probably not going to be successful in preventing it from leaking. What you've probably done is you've probably rolled the O-ring out of its seat here. You need to remove it and see if you uh, can correct that, get the O-ring back into its seat. Typically, by moistening, if you don't have any plumber's grease, but Plumber's grease is really something you should have. It's going, to, it's going to make your life just so much easier. So again, never put a wrench on this nut because if you crack it, your day is over. The aluminum keeper ring and this nut is just to keep it from pushing back out of the, uh, the uh, attachment of the double O-ring connector. And uh, again, the watertight sealing only occurs via these two O-rings. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make my final connection here on my, my flush cart now that I have gone ahead and put my plumber's grease in my fitting. And now we're ready to go. It's always a good idea to go through and just double check all your connectors, make sure they're good and hand tight. Don't want any of those unpleasant surprises. And we're now ready to take it to the next step, which is preparing the, the uh, flow controller, setting those valves and getting the flush cart ready to add water to. Now that we've got our hoses connected and we've double checked all of our connections to make sure that everything's good and tight, it's now time to uh, roll our three-way valves, our internal three-way valves, so that we will initially be flushing the loop only. Probably a good opportunity for me to point out, here we have what's called our geoprime tank. This can be a semi-pressure or a pressureless tank but in this case, we're going to make that a separate video segment. We'll come back. You can actually see that as a standalone video segment. So for this flushing video, we're going to be actually having these three-way valves oriented so that we're going straight by the tank. We're not actually flushing anywhere through the tank. It's going to go straight through it here and right into the flow controller as if it didn't really exist. So I just wanted to explain that little part to it. Again, the GeoPrime tank, it'll be a separate segment. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put these valves in the position so that they're going to be bringing fluid in and out through our flush hoses and going to and from our loop only, not through our, uh, through our heat pump. As you just saw, I used a three inch inch drive with an extension so that I can get in there and easily rotate those valves. So this is gonna be a necessary tool whenever you're going to be uh, flushing one of these systems. So now we're going to prepare a few other items here on our flush cart. One of the things we're going to do, we're going to insert our pressure gauge and that's going to be inserted here in our PT port. Now, as you've seen earlier, there's an important component which is installing some, again, non-petroleum-based plumber's grease to the inside of that PT port. 
which will give you good long life and allows you to insert your various metering devices without causing any issues with the rubber grommet that's inside this peach plug. So we're going to go ahead and install our pressure gauge now. It's important to use a good quality gauge, but it's also very important that you use a gauge that has a good size dial on it. You don't want to end up with one of those little two or two and a half inch dials because the scale is so small, it's difficult for you to see if there's much change in pressure. If we get a larger dial here, it's easier to see if you're seeing any kind of variation in pressure, it's easier to actually measure that. So make sure you're using a good quality pressure gauge. I recommend you have a spare one in the truck, but never bring two out and use two different ones on the same process because you can actually have some calibration variations in pressure gauges. So when you're actually performing some tests on the heat pumps, please only use one pressure gauge, but it's always a good idea to have a backup in the truck. So now one of our next steps is we're going to bring in our municipal water source here. This is a full port one inch ball valve. Again, this is on the suction side of our pump, and over here between our tank, our reservoir, and the suction side of the pump, we have a full port one and a half inch ball valve. So we're initially going to use our municipal water source to help fill our loop system. Well, that means that we're going to need to close the valve because we don't want that water filling the reservoir at this point. We're going to let that come back from the loop to fill the reservoir. So when I open this valve, our fluid's going to come in and it's going to help purge the air out of our volute going to come around and we'll use that again under municipal water pressure to initially fill the loop. So let's go ahead and show that process. Now what we need to do, this is an important step here because we have a vertical pump, we need to burp the volute itself. Okay, now we've got all the Air out of that. Now we're ready to go open up the valves over at our flow controller. So now we have our uh, municipal water source on. It's time to go ahead and open up our flush hose valves. This is another part that a lot of manufacturers that sell flush carts for some reason don't seem to install, and that's full port isolation valves on the end of the hoses. And that's a very important part because when you get done flushing the system, you need to disconnect your hoses. In the absence of these valves, you'll actually get a fair amount of spillage out of the end of these hoses, and then you have to clean that up. Remember, sometimes this is not out in the garage. Sometimes this is in a laundry room or a basement. So uh, a sizable spill can be a bit of an issue. So make sure you put full port isolation ball valves here so that when you're done flushing, you shut these valves. Now you're dealing with a very small amount of area that might uh, spill a little bit of fluid. Again, in our training lab only, this is an acrylic uh, clear PVC. Again, we don't recommend this in the field whatsoever. Uh, this is just for uh, purposes of our next segment when we're going to show you the uh, GeoPrime tank. So when I open up this, uh, this ball valve and the return ball valve, we're going to be using the municipal water source. It's going to enter the loop over here, go through our five 300 foot training lab circuits behind me. It's gonna come and again, it's gonna go straight through our GeoPrime tank coming back down through our flow controller and begin to fill our reservoir. Let's go ahead and apply that. Now the water's entering here, going through our loop. It's coming back, it's going to go through the flow controller and the pump. It's going to follow the hose. This is our return hose here. It's going to be coming back through our 80 mesh screen coming up and it's going to start to fill our reservoir. When it gets just slightly above that T, then I'll turn the pump on. We'll start to use the pump to dislodge the air. So now that we've got our water level up to about here in our reservoir, again, there's another distinct advantage of our sight glass. You can actually visually from the exterior see where the water level is in your reservoir. That's the entire purpose of it. Now it's time to close our municipal water source and open the valve between our reservoir and the suction line of the pump and start up the pump, start to purge the air out.
I'm going to use my foot to open up the municipal water source to make up the water as we're dislodging the air out. Nice advantage of having a ball valve down here is you can use this with your foot and keep an eye on things. Again, it's very important to maintain the water level higher than the T that's in the reservoir. You can see a good example here in our clear acrylic tubing, the uh, minimum of two feet per second velocity. Again, critical if you're going to remove air out of a geothermal loop. Something you're not going to accomplish with just a typical circulating pump. Again, high head, high flow, minimum two feet per second through that entire loop field in order to get rid of that air. So we've been purging our loop here in the lab for some period of time, by the way, Purging a loop is not amount of time you spent, but it's the thoroughness in which you have verified you have removed all the air. It's not just, I've been flushing it for 20 minutes. If you do that and don't do the steps you're about to see, you're probably gonna end up with an airbound system and you're just going to be simulated a leak. So please, this is a very important component. Make sure you're implementing this. So I no longer see any air bubbles coming back up in the reservoir, so I think I'm starting to get in pretty good shape. So let's, let's verify through a deadheading process if we have any air and see if we can move it out. So we're going to set our O-ring here on our sight glass up to our water level. And now we're gonna come over here, we're gonna deadhead the pump. We're gonna let the pump pressurize the loop I'm gonna keep an eye on my gauge here, and when I first show this valve closed, we're going to build some pretty tremendous pressure very quickly, and when it gets up to that high point of that gauge, I'm gonna throw that valve open, okay? So now we have pressure trying to escape out of the loop, and it's also being pushed by our one and a half horsepower pump. And we're gonna do that several times. The purpose is to try and dislodge that air and move it out of that loop. So I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna throw the valve closed, throw it open very quickly. Wait a few moments, do it again. Wait a few moments, do it again. Now I'm going to let it circulate for just a moment or two. I'm then going to take a look at my sight glass to see if we have dropped fluid level. If we have, that means that we were successful in moving some air out. Because liquids do not compress, only gases or air does, when we deadhead that pump, if we see much fluid drop here in our sight glass, that means we still have air in the system. We are not done purging. Don't walk away from one of these systems until you have achieved somewhere about three-eighths or, or less of drop in this kind of a sight glass. That means you've successfully removed all the air. Remember, you only want to do this once, so do it right.